uh, the first 15 minutes are dedicated to a more general introduction for the students. Mm -hmm. So, yes, and then we'll the other the people will come. Okay, please. My Thank turn. you. Okay, so I, I think told that I should say frame essentially the talk in a more general context. Okay, so the, the talk has to do with uh, what's going on in a subset of what is generally called quantum information. It is a field emerging in the 80s and 90s, started to be papers on that. Uh, the basic idea uh, might sound a little bit poor, but I think it's the most correct one, which is that our control of quantum mechanics is reaching the point where we could consider not discussing whether it's correct or not, but to take advantage of it. So doing engineering, quantum engineering, the first steps of quantum engineering could be understood as the field of quantum information. So there are very, very, very many different issues in quantum information. <coughs> there are issues about theoretical uh, information theory. So what can you do if you encode uh, information not in bits, but in qubits? And therefore, what are the new protocols that can be used for, let's say, communication? How can, can we communicate in different ways? Indeed, for instance, there is all the, the complete field of quantum cryptography. We can communicate in a different way because, for instance, we can generate entangled pairs, we can generate singlets, and send a piece of my singlet to Alice, another piece of the singlet to Bob. And Alice and Bob have a quantum correlation that violates Bell inequalities. So, how can I be sure that nobody is interfering? Well, if somebody interferes locally, it projects the wave function. And the projected wave function in a singlet is one of the two terms and does not violate Bell inequalities. So I can distribute, for instance, information, check Bell inequalities, I sure, I'm sure that I'm keeping a secret. Okay. So this is another way of doing cryptography. There are other areas like quantum computation. So can we do computations in a faster way? in a better way? Is it trivial to see whether yes or no? Well, this is highly not trivial because, as you know, quantum mechanics has one advantage, that is the superposition principle. We can carry superpositions of states and process them with unitaries in parallel. <coughs> so it seems that we have an exponential speed up. But yet, when we measure, the collapse is probabilistic, so we don't necessarily read what we want to read. So, to what extent we can combine the two things in a way that it is better for us? And uh, although we have been working on that for many years, there are very few examples where quantum computation is exponentially better than any classical device. But by now, fortunately, we do have examples. Those are not only Factorization, which is a big known problem because all the classical cryptography is based on ideas of the, of the type of RSA cryptography, which is based on factoring large numbers. But there are other problems like going through a mesh. It turns out that if the solution is one of the outputs of the mesh, quantum mechanics can do it much faster, exponentially faster. Okay. And there are other examples. Not only these ones. Uh, but it turns out that uh, people get nervous because they have to apply for grants and to get money. And all these things are very far. Quantum computer is very far. Quantum <coughs> cryptography needs to be very fast to send zillions of bits. And at the present rate, it's still slow and needs a quantum channel. So, can we do other things which are not that ambitious? But they are quantum, and they are better, and they have never been done before. And that's the frame for quantum symbols. So it's the idea that maybe we can uh, manipulate quantum systems to behave as other quantum systems. And we learn from those other quantum systems through our control in a quantum system. So it's like going back in history and thinking what was analog classical computation. Suddenly, we discovered that the system behaved like the other, classical, and we could 
use one set of physics laws to describe another set of physics laws. So analog simulation. Nowadays, this is what we are trying to do with <coughs> simulation. Okay. Uh, within quantum simulation, there are again zillions of things. There are people trying to understand uh, condensed matter systems, strongly coupled condensed matter systems. We have been simulations of, uh, of networks, uh, of triangular lattices, for instance, which are frustrated systems, very difficult to handle with Monte Carlo, so they are doing with simulation. We have simulated phase transitions, so for instance the MOT insulator phase transition on, a, on that, that describes superconductivity has been simulated with gases, with cold gases, in a remarkable set of experiments. And uh, nowadays, in the last three years, <laughs> the experimental techniques are able now to address single atoms in cold uh, atoms. So we can, as an example, a guy, very well-known guy, Emmanuel Bloch, has been able to write Psi in atoms in the air. Okay? Why? Because now we control these atoms individually. So we make a, a, a gas, a nano, 100 nano Kelvin. Not only it's cold, it's a Bose-Einstein and condensate, but we make counter-propagating lasers. We put one atom in each side, and now we address individually. And this is the tool, the Fox. Right? It's really spectacular. Okay. I was telling Sven before, not that this summer, by entangling two ions, we use one to keep uh, the time as a block, and another to check that the time is correct. But we use a, a control knot gate to entangle that. And uh, in this way, we can control with frequencies which are easy, like ultra fine, hyper fine frequencies, but we use for the clock the optical ones which are much more energetic, and the frequencies are much larger. <coughs> and this way, the first clock of one part in 10 to the 18, much better than the phantom clocks that we had uh, five years ago, is now present, and it is one part in 10 to the 18. And uh, as the big example, the Wineland, the Nobel Prize Wineland, took two of them, synchronized them, and in raising one, you see the gravitational effects, because time depends on the in gravity, so you have general relativity at the level of two centimeters, three centimeters. So if you raise three centimeters a clock, the pace is different. So we can detect the Earth by right? just the mismatch of the clocks if they move three centimeters. Another example is that these clocks are ions and they are trapped in a, in a trap. So if you take an excited state in the trap rather than staying steady, they move. Okay? They move in breathing modes, they move like that, there are several states. But these motions are small velocities, but they are not zero, and they produce a shift in special relativity. So these clocks on top detect on which energy level you are trapping the atoms, because they have the shifts of special relativity. They measure all of these things. So the message, because I, I would like to hear questions, is that the progress of quantum information, quantum simulation, quantum communication, all these things are making steady but very solid progress because of the improvement of experimental devices, which is absolutely spectacular. Okay. We are living a period, a golden period of experimental improvements. Questions? Come on. I made it in five minutes just to have questions. <laughs> You are all in particle physics, all in cosmology. Or in so how long will it take to have uh, the first quantum computer? How? How long? <laughs> well, uh, it's a matter of qualifying quantum computer. If you want to qualify it as a single gate, we have it a long time ago. If you want to qualify it as, as factoring 15 into 5 and 3, we had it a long time ago. And even now have up to uh, 
nine fully controlled items. So any operation with nine qubits is not. So if you qualify it as a useful or a quantum computer that that is better than a classical computer, then we are far away. Okay. But nowadays there are examples of of factorization. Shor's algorithm have been implemented with number thirty something. Something like that has already been factored in an example. So we have already things that compute for us. Okay? So it's not theoretical, it's uh, experimental. The, the way it works is that in ion traps you can control the levels, the internal levels, and you can transmit entanglement through the motion of, the, of these things. And uh, what happened is that, that it's difficult to carry many of them in the ion trap, and on top, not only you have to do that, but if you say control not, it has to be done with a high efficiency. So the big progress has been in having gates that have 99.7% of efficiency. Okay. This is the progress. And nowadays, one gate is done with 50 pulses. And uh, the order of magnitude of gates that can be operate non-local gates, it's of the order of 100. Now, how many would we need to break current codes, it would be of the order of 100,000. So we are very, very far. You need codes now, they are typically 1,000 or 2,000 bit codes. And a plus error correction from the ancillas for computation, you need 100,000. That's the order of magnitude. Of course, that that's, that seems very clear that we will not be able to put that with ion <coughs> <laughs> so you should consider ion traps like the beginning of these things, and, but eventually you should go back to solid state. Okay. That's the chips. Any other questions? Come on. Hmm. We're leaving a revolution and nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Even the particle physics detectors will change. Change because of all these things. Our devices are changing. So Please. Yeah. Why would you saying they would change? Wouldn't they just get faster? I said that this this progress will get uh, to many other fields in the way that the instruments will change. So we be better, more precise. Not faster, but more precise. Okay. It's a, you know, interferometry is the best we have now for making measurements. Uh, here you are talking about the interferometry of the phases, the superpositions. We want to, to think in, in a very elevated way, no? In why quantum entanglement and all these properties are so good to measure things because it's like encoding all these interferometric ideas into relative phases. So you're saying that this will be, I'm not, I'm in front of, I don't know if I actually go away in one um, you're saying that these would be relevant in particle physics or cosmology experiments, and you're saying that the quantum computer is, is far, far away. Is this implementation into yeah, I think, uh, experiments, is that also far away, or is that in, it does something well, I, I think in, in the... I, yeah, you, you know, I, I, I'm trying to get away from all this hectic behavior of asking for grants and... Mm. Okay, so let's discount that, okay? So what is the natural course of physics? You have an instrument, you measure something. Why this is new? Because your instrument is good. Okay? Because CERN built LHC, we can have the Higgs. Otherwise, we don't have the Higgs. Now, because what you discover might bring some new light into physics, you improve your experiment. Mm -hmm. And the new family of experiments, it go. it's <coughs> a feedback. So what I'm saying is that this is what's happening there. No, I mean, you, we got new ideas in quantum information, we thought of a control not gate, mm -hmm. this was implemented, and as we implemented that, then we said, and what about multiple tight entanglement, and now we have, and like that we're improving. Now we are getting at the point that we control entanglement with large amounts of, of particles. I mentioned to you before, after 
mechanics, things like that. Well, these are a new generation of machines. Okay. They have a much better position. Mm. So we will do the physics that we are doing with better machines. That's exactly the same. So very likely, the, what will come from, from quantum information to other uh, branches of physics might be in the form of new instruments, which is good enough. Not only a quantum computer, it is a particular case. Oh. Yeah, like any unexpected results? Any and unexpected? Unexpected, yes. Because you, you think about, I think, a background or a model you want to test and then you construct it yeah. what you want. So. Well, in terms of laws of physics, well, there is no new law of physics, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. exactly. You may find interesting that now Bell inequalities is, uh, in many universities is a small exercise you go to a lab in the first course right? in Geneva. You go there and you violate Bell inequalities with a thousand standard deviation in 10 seconds. Then you go <laughs> and you study classical physics. No? I mean, it has clean. When I started, people were debating. Oh, quantum mechanics. Uh, now, we are reading enough of that. Okay, mm -hmm. we don't have to do that. So, because of this cleaning, uh, they, there are many new questions which are addressed now. Let me give you an example. What is a, a theoretical one? All these correlations. Okay, you can see that all the theories that deliver correlations. You go to the lab and you measure correlations. Well, some of them can be described classically. Some of them, no. This is the Bell inequality. It's a polytop that captures classical correlations and leaves outside some correlations that cannot be described classically. So, because now we understand this polytop in full glory, okay, the question is, is there a quantum polytop? Can we go to the lab and decide whether quantum mechanics is the ultimate theory? Well, this has been done. Okay? So the, instead of the Bell inequalities, what are the quantum inequalities have been formulated and have been tested in the lab. And lo and behold, the experiment says that they go right to the, be to the quantum inequality. So the correlator, which is called this CHSH, has to be less than 2 if you're in classical physics has to be less than 2 square root of 2 if you're in quantum physics, has to be 4 if you are only causal. Causality only poses 4. Now we go to the lab and we measure 2 square root of 2. So that we have now evidence that at the level of correlations there are no more non-local correlations than those of quantum mechanics. Is that expected <coughs> or unexpected? I think it's a beautiful result. Okay? But this kind of thing those, why we, this has been solved in the last 10 years? Because we have fantastic machines to measure now. We have single photon detectors. We have parametric time conversion. We generate pairs on the millions per second. That's why we can measure these things in this way now. But there are many examples like that. Uh, I was talking also before with you about new ideas to simulate classically quantum mechanics. Well, we have understood that the entanglement is the big thing. So why don't we do that? Why don't we devise new analytical methods that rather than describing physics as we did before, we describe the entanglement that is there. And there is a big branch of people devoted to that. Today I checked the archive, and there are three or four papers on that in the quant PH. Okay. So a piece of the people doing quantum information are now devising new algorithms to handle quantum mechanics in the classical should I start now? Yeah, I think, I think we should start. So thank okay. you so much. And, uh, yeah, so for all the others, today is a talk is by Jose Ignacio Latore from Barcelona, and we talk us about quantum simulation or geometry and topology. And yes. Okay. Yes. So, and how long should I? I accommodate to whatever. Uh, so Good time. Well, three, three, ten or so? Three, five? Yeah. yeah. Okay.
Okay, so this is peculiar. No? <laughs> I never did that uh, 15 minutes and then the talk. Um, instead of evaporating, the audience evaporates. <laughs> okay, so the outline. Uh, I say, you, the outline. Well, this is my way of understanding what's going on. Uh, from from the description of nature understood as all the fields that very likely are represented here in the in the school of physics. You know. And if you think, well, they said that more than 50% of the gross national product is related to quantum mechanics no? in every country. But in physics, it must be 90%. Everybody has quantum. And then, you know, all these other things, which are not official quantum mechanics, but they started to emerge. Philosophy, the concept of randomness, uh, has been, for instance, proven for the first time. I don't know if you have ever thought about whether a number is random or not. Uh, can you prove a number is random? Can you prove that? Okay. Turns out that there is a theorem that says that you cannot in classical physics. Okay. So it turns out that you buy a machine in the mall and they said it's a fantastic random generator. You go to your place and you check. And you said, yes, it obeys all the distribution of momentum. I will build a casino. And then you accept bets. The guy who put a random generator with a cycle of uh, 10 to the 10 knows exactly everything. So he comes first day and he ruins you. <laughs> so it can be well, it's known that there is no classical randomness, no, no provable randomness. Well, the big thing is that now, uh, if you use bell inequalities, you can in principle prove randomness. You can buy a machine and check it. Because there is no classical algorithm that can reproduce the, the, the pair of correlations. Yet, it is peculiar that to check the machine, accepting quantum mechanics, you need to have a classical choice of directions. And this is not random. So, so it's extremely sought. There are now workshops just on randomness. Non-locality, computation, quantum simulation, teleportation, cryptography. Let me tell you that the control of positions and time, as I mentioned, the new generation of sensors, NV centers, have you heard of that? Yeah. Nitrogen vacancies. Well, you have carbon-13 with a spin, carbon-12 without. You have a diamond. You have a, a one atom of carbon-13. So it has a spin. Let me play with it. I will encode information here. But now, what I do is that I have another one, which is the nitrogen, and they interact. I play with nitrogen, and his interaction with carbon-13 dictates what happens to carbon-13, <coughs> because the frequencies are different. So I can encode a state, but then I would have decoherence because it interacts with my nitrogen. So what I do is I measure all the time, full time, I keep measuring nitrogen, and you have the Zeno effect. If a quantum system is measured all the time, it collapses with probability going to one into the same state. So I frozen. By observing nitrogen, I keep memory in the carbon 30. This is the way, I mean, <laughs> this is pure quantum mechanics. This is the way people now have memories of a one minute in the lab. One minute of a quantum state in the lab. Topological order, artificial system, quantum biology. Well, if you want to know, I can tell you later. Superconducting qubits, quantum engineering, tensor networks. Okay. So, what I will do is uh, talk about uh, quantum simulation. The basic idea is that Rarely, we have means of computing exact things. We have some integrable models, we have some systems with a lot of symmetry, we have the classification of conformal free theories in one plus one dimension. We have a few examples where we know the exact things. But in general, this is not the way to proceed, because we have a theory for superconductivity. We have a Hubble model, we want to solve that model. We have QCD, we want to solve that. But this is not exactly so. So we resort to approximate methods. But eventually, we go to numerics. So the question is whether, besides all these typical approaches, we have something different. 
and the other approaches civil evolution. So although the laws are different, we measure time in equivalent ways using different properties like friction, like the oscillations of the pendulum, because in some regime of the parameters that control the system, the behavior is simple. Okay? This is the philosophy of dealing the with the physics of spins in a network, like could be superconductivity are simulated by neutral atoms in an optical lattice. It's the fact that these guys uh, move here that becomes the uh, presence or absence of, of an atom in a site, and the uh, interactions are substituted by the barriers these atoms suffer when they move around. But if we manage to control that, the physics is the same. So, in quantum simulation, only what, but why, when, where, who, we do all these things. Let me answer a few. What is just that? There is a Hamiltonian of interest with a set of parameters, and there is a controlled system with completely different physics, but which is well controlled. So what can we do with that? Well, let's think carefully. Quantum computer should be able to do everything. Classical computer is restricted to whatever is done with Monte Carlo and Tensor Networks. So let's look for things which are neither the big problem, neither the small problem. But lo and behold, here is where many of the problems of physics are. You see, it's superconductivity. It's a phenomenon that contains an amount of, of entanglement which goes with the area law, eh? as you may know. Uh, not with the volume law, that would be the dramatic Change. If you address a problem which is very difficult, the NP-complete problems, you can check that the quantum versions have volume low entanglement, so it's very messy. So physics is less than the very complex problems, but definitely more than what we can do in the computers. Uh, so what people have done so far, this is a long issue, and there is even a special issue recently published by Blatt, Bloch, Thirak, and Zoller. I don't know why, but I, I think I stop. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> but look, uh, uh, a short list is uh, people are obsessed with models beyond classical simulation, many body criticality, so half a model. Uh, spin liquids, things which are not obvious, problems with frustration, triangular, entangled lattices, non-abelian gauge theories, uh, on physical models. You can see with physics, which is on physical. You see the client paradox of zeta Verweggen. zeta Verweggen is a, a paradox with a, with a Dirac equation, which is solved by QD, by per creation. Okay? But if you don't accept per creation, if you just simulate the equation of motion of the rack, you should see zeta vector. This has been done in Austria in, at uh, Innsbruck by Blatt, by this guy. Blatt, Thirac, and Zoller, not Bloch, are the guys who made the first control not quantum gate. So when Nobel Prizes reached the level of two bodies, they gave the Nobel Prize to one particle. Now Wineland and Harash are one particle. Control of one quantum particle. When we get to two, they are the natural candidates. Quantum chemistry, there is a lot of effort now of addressing chemistry with quantum devices, not with classical devices. And I will tell you a little bit of what we have been doing. So this is highly non-technical. Okay, it's a descriptive idea. So let me tell you what we did uh, with my colleagues Boada, student Chelly, Pozak, Levenstein, the big boss. So what we did is the following. We did three things, and I will tell you the results. We took the Dirac equation and said, okay, can we simulate that? And people have done that. Uh, you will see how they did that. Uh, what we said is, 
Could we simulate that the space is curved? Okay. The space is not curved, uh, for first approximation. But can I reproduce the <coughs> physics of, of some space-time? Yeah. So what we did is the following, you discretize, simply take the Hamiltonian, you take your conventions, I mean two plus one dimensions, you simply write the equation, and you discretize. And you see, this is what in condensed matter people would call, we ask you to Fermi Hubble model. It's peculiar in the sense that the Fermi jump in the x direction different than in the y direction. That's precisely the Dirac equation. Okay, the fact that when you put all these things together, you have this property. Now, how could we add the uh, curve spacetime? Well, you simply write the covariant version of that. You write the spin connection, you write your field binds, and you choose a metric. So we choose this metric to guarantee the conservation of energy, and you have some indices which are curved, some which are not curved. And you proceed. And now you discretize. And to make it explicit, I'm writing this for a regular space time uh, that has this x dependence in the time coordinate. Uh, this is the reference frame seen by an accelerated observer, falling in a black hole, if you want. And uh, you substitute that in the previous equations. You can even do it in, for any function, not just for the regular. And what you see is that all the effect of curvature goes only into the coefficient in front of the very same action as before. It's actually inherited from the square root of minus g that you have in the action. So this is what you should simulate. Now, why is this so? Well, this is the point of gravity. What, what do you mean by curvature in space-time? Well, everything is formulated on a Hamiltonian. A Hamiltonian are energy cost. So you have a kinetic term, energy cost of moving. You have a, uh, an interaction term, energy cost of interacting. When you put a screw root of G there, what you're saying is that the interaction, the cost, sorry, of moving depends on the position. The square root of G, depending on X, is telling you that now moving is more difficult or easier than if I were in a flat space. It's a cost in energy. So this is exactly what, we, when you discretize, what you get. If you now make a model where the jump from one position to the other, it's a function of the position, you are now <coughs> simulating gravity, a gravitational background. So this is the idea, and uh, well, here you have the implementation, what would be for regular space. Okay. So it is the idea is that as you move in one of the directions, the cost of jumping increases. And it increases linearly. That's free freedom. If it were other thing it would be different. So it's similar to spin glasses. Say that again? It's similar to spin glasses. Well yeah. spin is random if you want, no? Yeah. But this is yeah. order in a way, no? Spin glass would be completely random. And here you have a a function. <coughs> That's why if you compute the correlator in that direction, you would have these best of functions that you could get in, in analytical terms. Because when you look in detail at, at what they mean, is that they are simply like a, in first order dilatation. So this was our first step, and then we decided to see, talking to experimentalists, whether we could go beyond that idea and try new things. And the second idea we had is. Well, why not an extra dimension? And this is very simple. All of them are very simple. Uh, here you see, what do you see here? <coughs> well, you may see a cube, no? Well, but you understand it is not a cube. Right? It's in two dimensions. Right? This, is, this is two dimensions. This is two, not three. But we see three. Why? Because our eyes is thinking that jumping from blue to blue is identical to jumping from blue to red. So it's about connectivity. I'm not entitled to, to jump from here to here. So dimensions is nothing but connectivity. If I engineer connectivity, I'm engineering dimensions. Okay? 
So can you do that in a systematic way? And indeed, if you look at the Hamiltonian and you separate one of the dimensions and call it D and 1. And let me play with this one. Well, I simply write the sum, which is a kinetic term, as the sum of the D terms plus the jump in sigma. Okay? So here I jump in all the directions, in D dimensions, and the one dimension I jump explicitly. Okay? This is exactly the same Hamiltonian. This is rewritten. Okay? But now think of sigma as not a physical dimension, but a species. So, for instance, I can decide to move in this direction and eventually excite to a higher level. And then I keep moving and de excite. So I'm moving in a transfer dimension. Okay? So you said with 2 plus 1 dimension, right? No, this is this is generic. This yeah, is this okay. is generic. Okay. Okay? This is indeed. It's just illustrating the fact that you can jump instead of a one dimension, you can do that. So why we call dimensions? Because the amplitude of jump is identical to jump in space or to jump in species. So it's a fact about the fine tuning of the amplitude of probability of jumping that defines completely the so it's the connectivity and that the amplitudes of probability are the same. So this is this the point is that in an optical lattice can be done with this control of vanier functions and you can adjust them. I will not enter into the details, but it can be done. And uh, this is an example of moving around, changing species, okay? I'm moving from here to here, but I change species, I move, I move, I move, I change. I can do everything. Because all the multiplication of paths due to the change of species, this is what produces finally the change of the propagators, the change of phenomenal dimensions, of scaling dimensions, all these changes. So and, uh, rotational symmetry now couples, couples species. Say that again? Rotational symmetry now couples species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. <coughs> definitely. Only if you adjust the coupling of the species, you would recover the symmetry that you call rotational. Otherwise, not. Yeah. And here is a little computation on a bi-volume. So rather than a complete dimension, only two <coughs> layers, but two volumes. So first step to fourth dimension. And you recompute everything. You recompute the. This is the critical point of the Hubble model in the bi volume. And you see that going from 3D to 4D, just the bi volume, the second step goes essentially halfway in the critical point. Okay? So it's, uh, most of half of the effect is already seen by only going to the bi system. And indeed, uh, all the propagators were developed. A series of exponential corrections, which are the colors that I'm okay. sorry, I didn't understand. How, how many of these modes are you effectively including? I mean, because you're how many? Because you're just putting the modes in. I mean, explicitly. Here. Depending on how many layers you put, depending on uh, this sigma, yes. how many layers you would have more or less modes. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have only two, then you have two. Yes. Sure. To recover the complete dimension, you need infinitely many yeah, yeah. But as I said, just with two effects like the change of <coughs> critical points are essentially there, because just two allows for an infinitely number of changes in the buffers of the correlators, and already you can you make a, a big game. But the, f the thing was that with all these things, talking to experimenters, I said this was still too complicated to implement. So they asked us to bring a new idea that was simple. And what we did is, uh, the last thing, which is published, is that we now thought, OK, let's try to make boundary conditions which are not there. So artificial boundary conditions. And what we did is the following. We took the very basic Hamiltonian and said, OK, so I should implement the connection of the first with the last. How can I do that? So you see, it's about the boundary condition. <coughs> if I close it or not. Well, the first solution is to take the system and bind. Okay? The second is to make a non-local interaction. If you can do that, 
you're done. The system behaves as if it were in a closed box. Or play with the idea that we did before, which is an extra dimension. So what we do is the following. So you simply take a model, a system with two levels, with two species. It can be excitations, it can be polarization, it can be anything. And in one dimension it moves, it also moves in the other. But I only add an interaction of change of species in the two boundaries. So what happens is that if I was on a given polarization and here I change the polarization, I move around and I change it back, I have a circle for all practical purposes. Now, the good thing is that this idea that has several predictions, uh, this is the one that finally is, we are working with people to implement it. And it will be on uh, yet another physical system. This is called uh, waveguides. So the, you have photons going in waveguides and they jump. So this jump is, this jump here is done between one waveguide to the other. So waveguides are not where the photon is in the X position, but it's moving and it jumps from one to the other. And polarization are the two species. So we will try to generate artificial boundary conditions uh, and add frustration in the boundary, play with all the possibilities in the boundary without ever having the boundary condition. Okay? So implementing through the species and the action on the boundaries of the species. Okay, so this was and I didn't say it, but you can make more abuse plans and you can have even uh, bottle, client bottles. The minimum is a control system of nine times. So this is the first part of what I wanted to tell you. Um, forget about what I said. It's that if you want to do quantum simulation, you have to think what is a relevant issue you want to simulate and then look for a system where that is controllable. And I gave you three examples. Background geometry in terms of site-dependent couplings. Dimensionality via species. And topology via site-dependent species coupling. Okay? If you manage those things, if you manage to have these, you're simulating that. And that's why, as I said, this is a, a dictionary for us to talk with experimental people because they understand the right column, the right uh, column. They understand what is site-dependent coupling, they understand what is changes of species, they understand these things. And now we want to have the simulation of those things. Okay? Now, is all these things said, well, uh, I think that you know, this kind of philosophy, looking for what is controllable in which system, is a natural progress in the next 10 years, rather than thinking of big quantum computers. Okay? Because that's what they can do. Okay. With that, we can do other things. Okay, so let me go to the second part. Let me provoke a little bit. Uh, well, you, you know, this is more provocative. If people working quantum computation. But do we need a quantum computer? Really, do we need that? Let me argue against that. We don't need it. Why? I'll give you an example. We build the quantum computer. We build it. Next day, first problem we, we perform, uh, we compute, we break a code, a bank code if possible. We break it. It's broken. Next day, the bank stops all the transactions. He buys a quantum cryptographic device, which are now in the market, and substitutes all the communication by quantum communications. Okay. Next day, what do we do with the quantum computer? <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we invented the computer to factor large numbers, and nobody is using that. So what do we do with the quantum? What? Okay. What is the definition of a quantum computer? Full purpose. So a series of arbitrary gates with precision. So you can perform any algorithm. <coughs> okay. In particular, if you would, if, if I could show you the <coughs> algorithm for 
breaking uh, cryptography, you would see that you need all possible operations. Okay. Now, you said you, we could do with the quantum computer the Hubble model, yes, but we don't need the, the quantum computer. We can do it with quantum simulation. We have done it already. Okay, so that's the point. That for the models that we are using, we don't need the full fledged quantum computer. Okay? So here is a, what I wanted to propose you. Well, one thing that we cannot quantum simulate in any possible way are all the properties that we learn in arithmetics. Okay? All the investigation that mathematicians do on numbers are genuinely independent of, of the laws of physics and the they don't obey an easy system. If you think, uh, you will see that, the, why the, I, I postponed the, the, the comment that shows mathematically that what I'm saying is correct. So maybe a quantum computer can eventually be much better than a classical computer to discover the laws of arithmetics. So for that, I jump right away on, the, on what I want to propose you. So imagine we could construct a state. So this is a cat, which is the superposition of all prime numbers. Okay? So imagine you have a device, and you have qubits, so you have 0, 1. You can implement any alpha times 0 plus beta times 1 in every guy. And I simply put, let me show it here. No, I don't have it. So. Imagine you simply have, we write it here, you have three guys, so you have the one, this is the three, okay? You have these, plus, you have the five, okay? So spin up is one, spin down is, is zero, so, and so on, okay? So you, you work on your qubits, and you prepare them in such a way that the spins that I'm putting there are representing exactly the, the prime numbers. So I have a superposition of prime numbers. Okay? Mm -hmm. So think, huh? your physical system, instead <coughs> of being a, uh, you know, a state of QCD or a state of the Hubble model, it's, it has been engineered to be the superposition of prime numbers. Now, how many of them are there? Well, I have n of these guys, because this is my register, this is really my quantum device, they are n. So there are a total of 2 to the n possible numbers, but I'm only putting here the prime numbers. So the total number of prime numbers is what is called the prime counting function. So the normalization is 1 over square root of them. No? So I'm having equal superposed <coughs> How many of them? Pi of 2 to the n. Okay. Now, I'm, think, I'm asking you to think what would happen if we could do that. Okay. Can we learn something about prime numbers? If so, let me then check whether we can build that state. Okay. And, uh, the first thing is that, again, when you stumble in deep mathematics, it's really amazing. Uh, prime counting is, well, it's a piece of the history of mathematics. So you know that following the sieve of Eratosthenes, you, you people argue in the past that the number of prime numbers scales as x divided by log of x. Okay? The, the, the theorem that exactly tells us the leading term of this behavior <coughs> was proven by a number of steps Riemann, Hadamard, de la Vallée-Poussin. And uh, we know now that the leading term is log integral of x. Log integral of x, indeed, the first term is x over log of x, but it has <coughs> corrections. Okay? So that we know from mathematics. It's a theorem. It's a theorem. What we don't know is the following, is that how much the actual number of primes differ from the log integral. Okay? What are the fluctuations? 
of the actual number of prime members versus the log integral. It's a beautiful paper by Riemann. I think it, it was only 11 pages. Uh, he wrote the statement that these should be less than square root of x, not x. Uh, but this is only true if the Riemann conjecture is correct. The Riemann conjecture says that the Riemann theta function, so the sum of the naturals to the s power, the function of s, has zeros on the right hand side uh, complex plane of s only in the vertical line s equal one half. So in that region, only if real of s is one half there are, there are zeros. The distribution of these zeros is, is, is one of the, again, big things of mathematics. So what Riemann proof is that this one half is this square root of x, the one half here. So he made this connection between the sums of one of the ns with the departure of the real prime numbers versus log integral of this. Well, it has been a big endeavor to know whether this is true, because this is again related to proving or not proving or disproving the Riemann conjecture. You know, and what happens is very peculiar. Littlewood, you know, the Littlewood and Hardy, the mathematicians of Cambridge of the early century, fought against this problem, and Littlewood proved that actually pi of x versus li of x should change signs infinitely many times. Okay? But after 2500, after x equal to 500, up to now, which, that we have computed the best number is 10 to the 24, has been no change of sign. Okay. But there is a theorem that says that there is a change of sign. Finding this number was uh, one of the, they are called now screws numbers, and the theorem that the mathematicians have now is that there should be a first change of sign before e to the 726. Well, a complete <coughs> PhD thesis of a guy who got PhD, uh, I think he took more than 10 years to make this computation. He would never get a doctor degree <laughs> because he would never complete the computation. But finally, he completed in 12, in 2012, he's from Bristol, Blatt. He made the, the largest computation ever of these numbers. Okay? So we know that. And now we can even compare, and we see it indeed that well, this is the naive counting <coughs> effects of the log x. The deviation is 10 to the 20 versus li is 10 to the 9, so it's correct. It's within the square root of x. There is no violation of the Riemann conjecture. So we are okay. Okay? But our computers can only handle up to 24 and if you want in base 280 bits. So it turns out that all our knowledge about the prime number counting goes to manipulating 80 bits. And this is the limit of the classical physics. So here you see why it makes sense to think that quantum computation may, because if we can handle 80 qubits, we are there. We are there. So we don't need 100,000 qubits. We need only 100. Okay. Now, uh, this is again to refresh what I was saying. So now, now you understand the problem. We can maybe do things read two things that are unachievable in classical uh, computers about number theory. And this is uh, the state for three, uh, so that you understand that this is a physical thing, and well, can be constructed, does it encode properties of prime numbers and so on? And the answer is yes to essentially everything. First, if you compute entanglement of that state and you compute entanglement Computed the reduced density matrix and you analyze all the elements, you can immediately see that the reduced density matrix of one of the qubits contains, it's defined by all these functions of twin primes, those are Euler series of subprimes. It turns out that you would go to the lab, you would measure them, you would reconstruct the reduced density matrix, and every element in the reduced density matrix is a function in mathematics. Okay. So experiments deliver the function. Okay. 
And uh, so this is just to see that it goes in the right direction. Uh, even how complicated this is? Well, let me think of that as a drawn state of A system. Is it very entangled or not? So I compute the reduced density matrix of half of the system, and I compute the von Neumann entropy, and I see how it scales with n, and uh, it scales as a volume. So it's a state which is more entangled than any ground state on, of any field theory. Field theories have local interactions, and they produce entanglement that follows the area law, like the black hole, the okay? area law entanglement. All field theories do that. All the ground states of every field theory has area law entanglement. Well, that state <coughs> is more entangled than any field theory. Here you have a comparison. What we call finitely correlated states, so states that have a mass, okay, mass gap. Entanglement is bounded by the mass gap. States which are critical in one dimension, so conformal field theories in one plus one dimension, obey a lock law with the central charge in front of it. The conformal field theory enters into the von Neumann entropy. All the area laws in these dimensions are obeyed by all the theories with local interaction <coughs> and translational invariance. The prime state has a volume, and all the random states can be proven. But if you throw, if you throw a stone in the sea of the field of space, that state, random state, has volume law entanglement. <coughs> yeah? Has an entanglement that grows with n, with the size of the number of particles. Okay. So this is saying that indeed prime states could never be simulated efficiently on a classical computer. So what I'm saying, either it works on a quantum computer or it doesn't work. And uh, can it be written? Can it be constructed? OK, so let me do it in two phases. First is, let me assume that there is a thing called primality test. And if that state passes the primality test, it changes the sign here, if not changes from 0 to 1. This is a gate, a control gate. It is controlled to the text. So indeed, if x is prime, which is all the prime numbers, it doesn't do anything. If it is composite, it changes to 1. Now we will see how to build that. But if that is possible, then you measure the, this ancilla, and with a given probability, you collapse onto the prime state. So this is a very typical technique in quantum information. You simply generate, you pass a test, you play with an ancilla, you measure the ancilla, and depending on how it projects, you have achieved something, you have prepared some state. So again, you simply pass the test, you, your state is the same, but now with the probability, which is 1 over n log 2, you project here, with the complementary probability, you project here. And in that way, you simply generate P of n. Okay. Now, because n is the number of digits, this probability is what we call efficient. It's not exponentially suppressed, but polynomially suppressed. We call efficient <coughs> if the laws are polynomial. Exponential is, is it is not. And uh, again, maybe you have heard about the Grover's algorithm, which is a way to generate a state in a controlled manner. It's one of the first algorithms in quantum information. Uh, let me say that if I'm not showing it, but the probability of that to work, it's one, and the number of operations you have to do in that algorithm is a screw into three. So again, this is probabilistically very <coughs> well behaved. So all these things show that that state can be created in an efficient way. So what remains is what could be measured that delivers something which is useful. And uh, the non-trivial thing, and this is what I would really jump and give you the result, is that indeed you have to be very careful, but you can produce the number of primes. Let me now eliminate. This is the construction of the test, of the primality test. We have to resort to theorems which are, again are very deep in mathematics, but all of them can be constructed in terms of gates, I jump over these, and the 
big, big result is the following. Is that quantum mechanic, quantum, the quantum mechanical computer can give an estimate that differs from, uh, from the log integral with square root of x divided by the log. So it is more efficient than what you need to disprove Riemann conjecture. Okay? So it turns out that quantum computation indeed can do in a faster way the computation of how many triumphs there are okay. using these non trivial gains. Uh, again, it's remarkable the progress of the people doing these things because nowadays they, 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 do, they manage to do all these things without even counting one by one the numbers. They use very complicated theorems that map the problem to another problem, another problem, and finally they solve a completely different problem. Yet, the quantum algorithm is much more powerful than the classical algorithms. So, as I said, the quantum computer could calculate the size of fluctuations more efficiently than any classical computer. And uh, this is my conclusion. The first part was about quantum simulation of properties in terms of experimental devices, what is needed in the device. And the second is whether we can bring series of members into one single register and do computations and measurements in that register so that we learn something about uh, arithmetics. So, thank you. That's it. Any questions? It's too so far so away from... So, so why, why do you say, I mean, we don't, I mean, you argued against quantum computers at some point. Well, uh, but I gave you an example that would be helpful. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. But the, we need more ideas like this. We, we need more things that uh, that the quantum computer would do well. No? Everybody has focus on very few of them. What is the experiment that starts actually? Do you know? Of well, the, yeah. Uh, as factoring, it's thirty-nine or something like that. So five. Egypt factorization, and, uh, which is but very good efficiency. The, so the, the best people in the world are now in Innsbruck. Uh, it's a sub, it's a senior guy in the, from the group of Blatt. And the, the good thing is that he the last year, so now we are finishing a module that does Fourier transforms, quantum Fourier transforms. So that's like object-oriented mm -hmm. experiments. So rather than going for one experiment, they went for a module of quantum Fourier transfer. So now they can uh, go much beyond whatever has been done before. Quantum Fourier transfer is used for the subhidden, hidden subgroup problem. It's used for synchronization, remote synchronization. It is used for factorization. It is used for phase estimation. So the, the secret of the exponential speed up of many circuits is because of the quantum free transform, which in classical physics is exponentially heavy, and in quantum mechanics is poly polynomially heavy. So it's good. I would say that, let me say that I think that in, in five years, uh, we won't be able to do big things, but it is no longer just the control knot. So we will have uh, you know, things. How does a quantum computer look like? Hmm? So how does a quantum computer look like? So is an atom strapped? Uh, yeah. Yeah. To see an atom. Okay. Uh, <coughs> want to see a quantum a state. State is good enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <See> something. <laughs> So it's some lasers and uh, here it is. <laughs> well, this is one. Okay. One. So th those. <coughs> this is a real picture of a real thing. So this is a uh, uh, trap. So each of these guys is a magnet. <coughs> it's an ion. It's an ion, and you play with their internal states and their motion states. 
Okay, so I can be excited or not excited, and I can move or not move. The motion is controlled by your charge, and it is controlled by the potential that you put there. So this gets like a harmonic oscillator, and uh, there are several states. So this is not the drum state because they are moving in this breathing mode. So it's one of these excited states. What they do is that they put them in that state, they shine them on the internal degrees of freedom, and they have fluorescence, so they decay, and then you take a picture. You simply control that on time, and that's the movie of all these very many thousand experiments. You put them together. No? At a given point, they decay, and they are like that. Like that. What's going on? How do you go to there? You put what first. What is this doing, for example? Nothing. This, this, is, was, this is a very. No, this was at the time, right after the time of two, only two, where you would do a control knot. Control knot? Okay. A control knot is the basic operation that needs interaction. So it's. I have zero, zero. So I have to build a unitary such that we take these options. Okay the system gets transformed into the following. This into nothing. This into itself. This into one, and this into zero. So what it does is that if this is one, change. The second changes. If not, it doesn't change. Okay? So if I'm zero, I do nothing. If I'm one, the second changes. In order to do that, you need interaction. So this is the first case C naught that has to be quantum and controlled to do the first step of computation. It turns out that with single full control of one qubit and this, they form what is called a universal set of operations that then you can do any unitary in the world with any number of qubits. So any number of qubits, you keep doing a single qubit, a control knot, a single qubit, Control not. These circuits can cover all possible unitaries in the world. So if your experimental device manages to do single qubit operations and air control not, you're done. Then you need precision control, fight coherence. Okay? So what happened is that these people managed the control not the first time ever in 19 something. So the next step was to get many of them on the control. So this picture is at the time of getting control of seven. Now they have 128 on the control. Okay. And they can do operations between the second and the 28. They can do that. So this is one of the platforms. There is another one with the, which is based on uh, superconducting circuits. So the qubit is, instead of being spin up, spin down, or excited, not excited, like here. Here I'm excited or not excited. Forget about the motion. Okay? Yes. In superconducting, this I'm left uh, circulating or right circulating. And you have superpositions. So quantum mechanics says that the superfluid could be simultaneous one, could be on the superposition of left and right motors. This is the technique used for this machine, which is called D-Wave. You have maybe heard on the news. I think California, they have this machine. Very controversial whether it's real, really coherent computations or not. Okay. That Google bought one okay. for $50 million. So. Well, I, hey, okay. <laughs> uh, as I said, uh, the future of, I don't know what I did. The future of a computer will not look like this. Hmm? Okay, definitely. Yeah. Like a chip. A chip. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they are people working on what they call atom, atom chips, which is in a chip, a real chip, uh, make a micro condensate there with a few, with one atom per atom. Or there are people using carbon nanotubes to glue in the surface uh, uh, atoms whose internal levels you control. So there, you know, people are doing crazy things. But uh, we.
we don't know which is the solution. Well, anyway, keep uh, an eye. You will see that very beautiful things will come. Yeah. These people are very clever. Any other question? <coughs> John? Well, you should say that there is a movie if somebody yes. wants to see it. So, in 50 minutes, or no, there will be a movie uh, with an interview of uh, Lauber, I think, who is the last living person of the Manhattan Project that uh, you realize and that uh, we are very happy, I think, to listen to. So. Yeah, if somebody wants to see, we have a documentary on the last guy who is alive from the atomic bomb. And, uh, Where will it be shown? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's half an hour, it's a 29 minute, 40 second documentary. <laughs> so. And if one is unable to see it here, what are the, how does one get it? I'm sorry because, uh, no, I've, uh, this question comes up all the time, but uh, the point is that we are showing that in, uh, in festivals and they, it is completely forbidden to have it on the public domain. Not that we want to make money, but Till we go to the festivals, yeah, we have yeah. to ha keep it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, next thing is... Uh,